who extends his um, blessings and greetings to all of you who have come here in the Dhamma today. Today we've travelled up to Portland. Um, Portland's already somewhere where I've, I've been before a few years ago when I was en route uh, to Seattle. This time, uh, based on the invitation from Tanajan Pasano, the abbot of Abayagiri Monastery, uh, we've come up here. And uh, coming up here like this is a nice opportunity to meet all of you and to uh, discuss Dhamma and exchange views. And uh, as a result, we can foster and, and, and increase our understanding of Dhamma practice. Practicing Dhamma is often thought of as uh, the big renunciation, um, the type of uh, practice that, that Sangha members do. But really, it's also, it's not just about that. Practicing Dhamma is a lot about um, arranging and managing one's daily life in an appropriate way, which leads to the, the arising of uh, wholesome qualities and, and true benefit for oneself and others. First, we understand that we have to uh, give rise to a, a wholesome or a, or a supportive physical um, situation in our lives. We have to live together with our family and friends and strive to bring about communal harmony. And so a life of benefit, first we have to understand this point, is that we need harmony and mutual understanding, otherwise we won't really understand what are true values. Practicing Dhamma then we learn to see ourselves as, uh, as, a, as a natural resource of, of spiritual values, which if we learn to harness and use, use, use well, will be of great benefit. So this is something we have to give great importance and turn our attention to. Uh, manusa, the word manusa means human being, but it really means a high-minded being or somebody of true qualities. Now our lives uh, have, have, the, have the, 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 are bound up with the, the body and the mind, it's just bare, bare phenomena, elements. And so we have the physical aspect of, of our lives, which is our body, and this is important. Uh, we have to support ourselves with food, and food supports ourselves. So that's one aspect of life. But then there's also the mental aspect. We need what's called sati and panya, mindfulness and wisdom, all round circumspection with how to go about managing and dealing with our daily lives. We have to learn simple things like how not to uh, offend people and upset people or not to have harmful effects on the environment and to live in balance with nature. The thing which we all want is sukha or happiness. And what this means is that our, uh, our lives uh, go smoothly without discomfort and agitation. And this will depend like whether we, um, whether we actually get the happiness we want depends on how well we're able to do our job, our task, which is to manage and deal with our lives and things which happen to us in the correct way. And the correct way to live is, is a life which doesn't give rise to negativity and enmity and breed hostility. And as a result then, we have to be very careful with all our actions, with all our actions of body and also our speech. When we're very careful with how we live, with our actions of body and speech, then this gives rise to uh, lots of warm interactions with other people and a sense of interrelatedness. Um, in the world we think of relatives as people who are our family members, who share our blood ties, or even uh, share, you could even talk about blood groups, people of the same, you know, we have various blood groups, uh, O, A, and etc. But really, in time we learn to see that we're all related in the sense that we all share this common experience of, of, of life, what it means to be a human being. And when we see that every single human being of ours is our relative in that sense, that we all share the same common experience, then uh, we become much more respectful and cautious and we have a sense of, um, we have a sense of concern with how we deal with other people. We don't go around criticizing other people and we, we seek to, f to nurture support and, and warmth towards others. So this is one way to use this natural resource of our own humanity or this human birth that we have. 
the the the, the Buddha always emphasized that Dhamma practice is about not giving rise to um, danger or or harm to oneself and to others and supporting others. So all of you coming here today, this is an act of mutual support. You're supporting your fellow human beings through this act of giving. And giving is what holds people together in life. All of us here have received so much from others in our lives, particularly (coughs) starting with uh, those people which the, the Buddha said are very hard to find in the world. People who give you without uh, wanting anything back and for all of us our primary givers or caregivers are our, our mother and father who right from the day we were born sacrificed everything for us usually with great loving kindness metta so we see that metta loving kindness is a fundamental principle of being a human being because it's the natural it, natu- it arises naturally uh, from mothers and fathers and when we have metta and develop it we become very careful with everything we do, with our speech, we're careful not to speak negatively or critically or from a place of, of, of heat and agitation or, or anger. But instead we always try and speak from a point from a place of love and care and loving kindness. And as a result everyone benefits. Because none of us can live alone. We all depend on each other. The the adults depend on the children or the old people on the young. Uh, the strong and the weak, the wise and the foolish, all live in mutual interdependence. And so we all have to learn to help and respect each other. And this, this kind of wholesome activity, anything that's wholesome, we call it bunya. Bunya is usually translated as merit, but it really means um, any activity which is spiritually enriching or, or enriches one's quality of life. The, the uh, uh, external acts of body and speech which lead to friendship, this is one way of, of seeing or of knowing this person has the Dhamma or lives with the Dhamma in their minds. So managing our lives as true human beings or high-minded beings needs sati sampajanya, mindfulness, clear comprehension and wisdom uh, rather than thinking and acting based on our moods and desires or our prejudices and criticisms. This kind of way of responding to life is a very narrow way. And somebody who does uh, uh, speak and act based on their moods and desires, negativities. The Buddha called a manusa tirajana, that means uh, a, an animal-like person or an animal-like human, i.e. not quite uh, living up to the, to the capacity of, of, of our, of our human, humanness. A life which is well-led we can call beautiful, and beautiful means pure and clean, this leads to peace of mind and coolness. It's not at all dangerous or negativity. And, and these kind of qualities, one of virtue and purity, these are respected and held up universally as, as noble. And anyone who is uh, virtuous will be, uh, will be a refuge to others in just the same way that we, we, need to, we need to take refuge or we need to use this earth surface for our lives whenever we walk, we sit, we stand, lying down, we're always taking refuge or using the earth's surface. One who is one who is pure and good in conduct, other people will, will take refuge in them and share in their qualities. So we need to learn to see the value of this natural resource that we all have within us. The goodness that we're striving for lies within us, our humanness is within us, it doesn't lie anywhere else. When our, when our body becomes overheated or heats up um, more than its usual level, we call this a fever. And it's the same with the mind. Whenever the mind is, is out of balance, then we feel unwell or ill at ease. It's like we feel hot and bothered. Sometimes the external environment plays a role. One feels confused, anxious, or it can be... Uh, because of our environment, we're getting intoxicated or lost. Uh, we lose ourselves, heedless, uh, finding, seeking delight in, in this and that. And as a result, our mind isn't balanced and what we call uh, in its normal state of balance. And so in life, tension and agitation, these things arise uh, from, from different types of um, in incorrect ways of practicing or, or not correctly leading one's life. For example, 
um, with regard our use of time. Our lives are, bou are bound up with a certain cycle or a certain rhythm of the passage of time. But if, for example, people in, in their daily life get lost in uh, seeking entertainment or having fun, these kind of things, you can basically get it wrong. And instead of resting in the evening and relaxing, because the night time, when, when it gets dark, naturally the body rhythm slows down and it's the time when we should use that for our relaxation and, um, and, and letting go. Um, people are still often stimulating themselves and you know, staying up late into the night. So as a result, the body's out of, out of balance. So just a very simple starting point is to make sure we're getting enough rest in the evenings and we're uh, putting um, and, re and really able to relax. But of course, it may well be the case that anxiety still uh, is present in our lives. So we have to find um, meditation objects or ways of uh, understanding the mind in a way where we bring down our level of anxiety and bring the mind back to its natural state. Uh, most of the time, though, we, we often don't quite get it right in our practice. Um, so we, what we have to, but our starting point is to understand we have to reduce this, this, this heat, this mental heat, uh, this mental intoxication or heedlessness, and abandon, try and reduce and let go of any tension. So we have to use all these ways these techniques and or find a way that works for us to develop peace and inner happiness. The first thing is to become aware of our mind and begin to bring it back to its uh, natural state of ease. The, the mind is something which has no um, material or external expression, there's no form or body to the mind. But nevertheless, we have to understand what an important role it plays in our overall health. Mental health, knowing the minds and knowing the moods, is, uh, is what, we're, what we have to um, focus on. Our thoughts and moods, you can, you can describe them as, as positive or negative, good and bad, or um, liked and disliked. In, uh, in, in, in our usual speak, we say, this is... I, uh, this is a mood or a feeling I like, or this is a mood or feeling I don't like, or now I'm happy, now I'm suffering. But uh, when you begin to see and understand the mind in line with reality, you see that both the kind of mind of happiness and the mind of suffering, neither of those are very good, because they can both um, cloud and obscure our thinking. Usually when we talk about... Uh, a feeling which is good or thoughts which we like or experiences which we like we say it's good in the sense that it's something we approve of or it gives us a kind of delight but it's a bit like children the way children uh, get happy uh, children are happy when they can play when they have toys adults are slightly different but still a little bit the same adults are no longer interested in toys but nevertheless, they get happy when they get things the way they want it. And so the Buddha taught us to abandon both of these, um, uh, not only suffering, but also the kind of happiness that arises in the external world. The Buddha taught us not to give so much importance to our moods and thoughts that arise based on the external world, because that kind of happiness doesn't lead to a life which is uh, smooth and, uh, and even. It's the kind of happiness, what, what the Buddha is teaching us to find is that happiness which arises when the mind has no agitation at all or, or no delighting, no intoxication and as a result no dukkha, no suffering. So it's the happiness that doesn't come from sensual pleasures, this is the, which is the happiness of delighting. The Buddha taught us to look for the, the peaceful mind. That's a mind which is pure. The mind which is peaceful, um, then all thoughts and all moods will feel uh, at ease. One will always be at ease. And there'll be no obstacles in life. So our starting point, you could say the, the kindergarten level of Dharma practice, where we should start is to look at our mind and our moods, see what thoughts we have arising, 
use, use our minds to look at our life. We all love ourselves and we all love uh, life. So it's very important then to look very clearly at ourselves and practice well. Instead of, then instead of uh, our usual deluded or foolish way of thinking, uh, we can bring up a much more clear and, and aware or much more circumspect way. We can see clearly and see the, the true nature of reality. If there's no suffering in our lives, if we've already gone beyond that, then there's no need to practice. Just like if something isn't dirty, there's no need to clean it. But for most of us, our, our minds are still uh, polluted, so uh, we do have to clean them up a bit. Uh, our desires, uh, or desire, is something which we have to um, we have to learn to learn to re relate to. We have to adapt and uh, relate to skillfully so that we're able to bring our mind much more into the present moment rather than constantly running out into the future and letting the mind drift back into the past. This movement into the future and the past is what takes us away from awareness. The most valuable state we have, or the most valuable state of mind, is the mind which is grounded in the present moment. Then we experience the present as the cause and the present as the immediate result in our life. Now one, uh, one, one way of, of, of looking at things is to say, well, if we don't desire anything, then we'll never do anything. You have to have some kind of desire. But that's not necessarily the case. We can learn to just, just do things without desire, like, like if we're doing meditation practice and just watching our breath, what we call watching our breath. We don't have to do it with desire. It can simply just be an act of watching nature, the nature of the body, doing its job. And as a result, there's quality of mind which we call ekagata, which means as the, the singleness of mind or unification of mind, literally supreme, the uh, one, uh, the supreme peak of, of, of unity can arise. But this takes time in order to become skilled and trained at this type of practice. But once you have trained yourself over time, then it's not very difficult. We understand we'll begin to see clearly how in our life there are certain causes and certain causes lead to certain results. There's a kind of logic in life. And so we'll begin to avoid doing those things which uh, bring us harm. We'll avoid making mistakes in our life. We'll see uh, the nature of, of life and just be able to let go. And whenever we do our activities, we'll just be doing them. When it's time to rest, we just rest. And when it's time to eat, we just eat. Just doing these things. There's no need to always be doing things with a mind of desire. So as Dhamma practitioners, we have to have constant uh, awareness in our lives. If we can really try to reduce and abandon craving in our lives, then this is uh, what we call uh, perfection. The freedom from craving is true freedom. And there are many skillful means to abandon craving. Skillful means to bring the mind to a state of peace and to see the world in line with reality. One, one aspect or one, one part of our training is called, we call samatha. Samatha means tranquility. And this is the way of training the mind to be still or very peaceful. Body tranquility, body stillness and then mental stillness. And this is what all of us have uh, the right to, to experience. To experience that quality of awakenness. Buddha means awake, holy or pure. And when our mind is still, then we call it uh, peaceful, bright and pure. It has peace, brightness and pureness as, as the mind's, as its uh, salient characteristics. And this is a mind which is safe. The peaceful mind is not hot, the, the bright mind is not agitated and it's free from doubts. And this is what we're talking about when we, when we say the word freedom. 
we can we can call our practice we often speak about our practice as sitting meditation or developing concentration but for the most part our minds don't concentrate very easily they don't get still and peaceful so we need lots of patient endurance in the practice to slowly uh, develop awareness and be able to observe our minds because we usually we have this this notion or this thought well I'll, I'll, I'll sit meditation and then I'll be at peace but uh, it's just often not like that even just the physical act of sitting often increases our pain and suffering so we need patient endurance in order to get used to this practice first. If you live near a river, you see that you'll know that water flows uh, from a high point downwards to the sea. And so you can, you can tell then that all the fish that live in that river, in order to stay in that river, they must constantly be making an effort to swim against the stream. So you know then that fish must have lots of patient endurance, otherwise they'll always just be swept into the sea. So there's an expression in Thai, you look at, by looking at the water, you can know the hearts, or know the minds of fish. So they have this constant patient endurance to go against the stream. So it's the same with us. We have to have this constant and enduring effort. We have to continually look at ourselves, but not with, not with our eyes not with our physical eyes, but with mindfulness. The physical eyes that we use, this is uh, one aspect, or they're bound up with our, our nervous system. But we learn in time, we, w one thing we know is that our eyes in and of themselves are not a perfect or complete tool. They have a, a certain flaw, and that is that in order to work, our eyes need light. It could be sunlight or the lights that we have on here. So we see that eyes don't work on their own. But when they do work and eyes experience things, then a mental image arises based on, on what we see through our eyes. And very often this mental image or the thoughts that arise based on what we see are often lead us to lead the mind away from peace. It's because we're, not, we're still not free from the external world or from the sensual world we get lost in moods and thoughts that arise based on the external world just in the same way that people naturally seek comfort and there's never this sense of enough we're never comfortable enough there's always this craving just like a fire as long as there's still fuel for the fire it will never go out so with mindfulness then we look using our mindfulness, the eye of mindfulness, to see dukkha or suffering in our lives. And if you begin to be aware of your dukkha, aware of your suffering, then that suffering won't, be, uh, won't have so much power over you. You'll see that dukkha or suffering is actually very much bound up with maya, which means illusion. And the mind which is bound up or, 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 or or, or tricked by illusion is a mind which is which is not yet um, come to fruition or, or, or wholeness when you do see uh, one's experience is very much bound up with delusion then the illusion fades just in the same way that darkness is dissipated by light you might wonder where did the darkness go it didn't go anywhere but light uh, replaced it or light gave rise to uh, brightness and so dukkha or suffering will disappear in the same way with what we call sati sampajanya mindfulness and clear comprehension dukkha suffering won't be able to um, bind us up and because our our mind uh, increases in its strength we increase in our clarity of vision as a result then we won't uh, lose heart in our Dharma practice will be like water which, which, which naturally according to the laws of nature must flow constantly downwards in the same way will gradually flow towards our, towards, uh, towards our, our goal in practice which is that freedom or aloofness 
from sensuality or the, sens the external sense realm and all kind of uh, worldliness or the worldly dhammas. But what we do need in practice is lots of patient endurance. 